but we've, we haven't tried this before. Um, and it's with whomever signs up for the meeting. So we didn't know how many of you there would be. And as I mentioned, there may be as many as 24 of us. So that's a lot for a book discussion. Um, but we do want to find ways to talk with our members and friends and share ideas, get things out to congregations. Um, you know, if you like this discussion, you could have it with a book study group in your congregation or some such. Um, and we've we put out our webinars, but there's often not enough time to talk over the subjects that come up and so forth. So this is just an attempt to see how it will work and we hope you'll enjoy it for however it goes. Um, we want everyone to be able to share their responses. So um, I'm going to try two things. The first is that uh, we'll share in the beginning and ask, as I said in my letter to you earlier, um, something that came up for you that you read in the book that you would like to share, that something that was um, kind of stood out for you that made you think or wanted, got you to want to do something or whatever. Um, so that will be the first part. We'll just go around and invite everyone to share. And then uh, when that's finished, we'll break into small groups and of about three or four people and invite you to share in the smaller group, either on the questions that I sent out earlier about each of the sections of this particular part of the book, uh, the first part of the book, or to just share what, um, what you yourself might be wanting to do with what you read. Um, I know for me, it's been important to, um, find people that will share what I want to try and do, which is tough if we really were going to stop shopping or do major changes in our lifestyles to help with the climate change. So uh, you're very free to go the way you wish in those smaller groups, um, but it's a, a way to share. And then we'll come back together. Um, maybe someone from each group would share something that was important that came up. Um, if you have that. And we'd love it if one of you would take notes and share that, say, in the chat or um, in the discussion time. So I'll, I'll start by um, giving something that stood out to me with the book and uh, then go around and invite you all to say your piece as well. Uh, this comes from really the prologue, just right at the beginning, McKinnon talks about the origin of our species in South Africa and the split of people going, some going north, um, becoming African farmers, European sailors, Chinese merchants, and Silicon Valley venture capitalists <laughs> with the others staying where they were um, and still are uh, as in that story. And they were just figuring out in all of these uh, over a hundred thousand years, how they would live on the land in their place. And that led me to think about places that have meant a lot to me where I've really been happy <laughs> and um, in my childhood, there were two of those places that have really lasted since. One was to, uh, my parents were teachers, so every summer growing up, we would, they would be camp counselors and I got to go camping. So for two to three months in the summer, I was on the land, in the woods, climbing mountains, swimming in the lake, mm. and getting to enjoy nature. And the other place was visiting my aunt and uncle's small farm in Minnesota and being with the animals, um, milking the cows, riding a horse, <laughs> and again, in a way, living on the land. So I, I feel very fortunate that I was so connected with nature. And I still feel that way. Um, and 
So when I read this book in that section, I thought, how could I change my life to have that kind of quality of life again? And I'm retired, so it's more possible for me than someone who's right in the midst of their career, that kind of thing. But I just wanted to share how much it came to my heart, I guess, um, as thinking about some way that um, I would like to live going forward and give up things I don't need um, and live quality of life. So that's my sharing. <laughs> um, we can go down the line. I, I'm not sure exactly how to get everyone to speak. Maybe just start. Can, yeah. Ken has go got his it. hand up. Good, go. Hi. Hi. Um, Somebody's got their. Yeah, if, if you're not speaking, would you please mute? Because somebody's got someone talking in the background. Hi there. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I did not finish the book. I meant to today to read the uh, solutions. Uh, it was very depressing to me, this notion that uh we have to stop shopping but we can't stop shopping and the only thing that i kept running through my mind is the solution here i'm torn between individual actions and and and, and large systemic changes i have always thought that individual actions don't aren't really going to get us anywhere i go back and forth from that i think we're going to have to have some serious <clears throat> uh system changes uh in the world i think it's going to be forced upon us i think it's going to come at a very high price uh and a lot of people are going to be hurt injured killed all of that stuff i but but i overall i am hopeful uh but you know our economy is so uh it it, it is just absolutely dependent on our throwaway culture. And my wife and I, we have tried not to be such throwaways. We recycle, but it's my understanding that most of the stuff that you put in recycling is just ending up in a landfill anyway. Um, you know, we've, we're, we're vegans. We, we try to help the climate with, with you know, not uh, including animal ag in our, in our lives. But um, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm anxious to see what you guys thought of this because I didn't get to the part where I'm hopefully the author is going to give them solutions. So thank you very much. I would just like to jump in quick and say, Kenny, that I have to disagree with you that if everybody took a little part and did what they're supposed to, all of us combined would make a huge difference. So please don't lose that attitude that one person cannot make a difference because you can, and we all can. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to read the book. I've been in three other book clubs. I've been trying to play catch up on all those and I'm just got swamped and I did not get a chance, but I wanted to join the conversation anyway, because I think this is a really important topic. We are such a consumer driven <clears throat> economy. And like you say, everything is throwaway, which just makes me sick. I've actually, since I retired, have become a scrapper. And I go through the neighborhoods and I pick up as much stuff as I can to take to the recycling metal place. I take tons of stuff to the restores and the thrift stop shops that can be salvaged because it just makes me sick what people throw away. When I buy something, I think of the end, what's going to happen to it when I'm done with it. So I try to buy things that can be recycled or if it's wood can be burned that won't you know, make bad stuff in the environment. I, I, you know, everything I do is, is as much as I can. And I realize not everything can be done that way because tires obviously are a huge problem. But I have just decided that everything I do is necessities only and if i do buy stuff it's at a thrift stop that can be you know i'm recycling reusing reducing whatever and then when i'm done with it i donate it back so that's what i do thank you well, individuals do make a difference one of the uh, the issues is that the the top one percent of the wealthy in our country and around the world 
that's people who have almost a million dollars or more, uh, produce as much carbon footprint as the bottom 50%. So those top 1% could make a big difference. Uh, it, but when you start getting down to the poverty level, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to really make much difference. When you talk about purchasing, one thing that I do sometimes is I look at stuff that's for sale and I go, oh, I wonder what this would look like as a piece of junk on my curb. And that talks me out of it a great deal of the time. <laughs> Good. So, uh, I'll, um, Charles. Oh. And, and hi. This, oh, this is, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. This is Kay. Um, and I, I'm living in Southern Oregon, um, but I grew up in the Midwest with um, Depression era parents. So learning to be thrifty was like second nature to me. Um, so the whole beginning of the book, I mean, he was like, he's talking to me about stuff I always was doing. Um, and it's like, try not to buy. And I still buy more than I need. Um, and somebody said to me one time, I have so many coats. It's like, well, you know, if you don't change sizes, but I have given coats away way to thrift stores um and that's what i do with my clothing is I, I try to to donate it but the other thing is i read long long time ago because i didn't finish the book I, I read the first four chapters um but buy local and try there's more and more um local agricultural and farmers markets especially in the west coast but i really really am focused on trying to buy local, um, whether it's presents that I give to people. You know, I love buying local art, um, local food, um, support the local economy. Um, and, and I figured that's one way I can decrease my carbon footprint because if I get away from buying avocados raised in Mexico, which is part of the green mafia, by the way. They went from drugs to avocado farmers and squeezing them. Um, but getting away from buying avocados and stuff that's really out of season that comes from, you know, Chile and Argentina and New Zealand, and just buying apples that are grown in the Northwest, you know, things like that. So I figured that's one of the biggest ways I can reduce my footprint. Good. Thank you. Charles, I think you're yes, ready. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I sympathize a lot with what uh, Kenny was saying. I've also uh, in the past struggled quite a bit with, um, you know, what can I do as an individual? And uh, I've done quite a lot in that area and eventually uh, sort of become a little disillusioned as, you know, is this really making any difference at all? And so I think that uh, it's it's important to do both. I think that we we need to act uh, to get changes on behalf of the public at large. We need to uh, start making big changes in our in our society and uh, making it mandatory that people uh, reduce uh, like carbon emissions, for example. Um, but I think that if you uh, and, and as the book points out, uh, it's necessary for us to actually, you know, reduce our economy. We, we've got to get over this idea that, you know, we can make a green transition and keep growing our economy. It's, uh, mm -hmm. They're just not really compatible. Um, and so I think that we need to really start calling for people to make big sacrifices. But to do that effectively and to have credibility in, in that approach, you need to uh, make some sacrifices, you know, in your in your individual life. You need to do things like, you know, stop flying on planes frequently, and you know, not own multiple houses and and multiple cars. So uh, I, I think that both are important, and one is kind of a, a prerequisite for the other. Good, thank you, Cindy. You put something in the chat, I think. I did. 
You want to say it out loud? <laughs> well, I just would like to acknowledge that I reside on the stolen lands of the Menominee and Haudenosaunee nations. And I was just at a blanket ceremony with the Menominee and Oneida and Ho-Chunk nations last night with a very powerful presentation where they put the blankets on the floor and then they have everybody stand on the blankets and then they give you different colored cards and they start telling about their history. And then they will stop and say, with the people with this color cards, please step off the blanket because you represent the hundreds of thousands of Indian people that were murdered. <clears throat> and then they will take away a blanket because that was some of their land that was being stolen away from them. Then they go on with another colored card. You people represent those of us who died from outbreaks of diseases. And then they take away another. Blanket. So it gets down to the point where there's like one or two people left on one blanket because the blankets represented their lands. And when you saw those, the big, you know, huge big circle of blankets, all of a sudden you're getting taken away and taken away. It really is very powerful to see how, you know, just everything went and how awful we were to them and all the things we brought on to them as far as diseases go and the alcoholism rate and the drug problems and everything was brought on by us. And it's, it was very powerful. Thank you. Uh, I may or may not be able to see your hands from where I am. <laughs> Well, Jane, if they have their unmute. hand up, they will, I mean, if they, they do the Zoom hand, they're the number one in the upper left-hand corner. So, uh, okay. What I'm really hearing, though, is if it weren't for, oh, I'll let Sally go. Sally go ahead, Sally. Uh, well, I have the good fortune of growing up in Paramus. Uh, I live on uh, stolen Lenape land in Bergen County, New Jersey. And boy, do we live our Sundays without shopping. We, uh, we, 10 miles east of us is the George Washington Bridge and we have lower sales tax on everything and no sales tax on food. And the New York folks come across that bridge on Saturdays and just jam up everything. Same as all the commuters during the week. So Sunday is our day off from traffic. <laughs> um, I don't know that it's such a sacrifice to stop shopping. Um, I am struggling with the fact that the book brought out about how many people's other livelihoods depend on shopping. But for myself, I can't remember the last time I bought a new piece of clothing. It's either thrift shop or I've got all the clothes I need. Or, okay, I take that back. I, I probably buy too many t-shirts from, from groups that are, uh, you know, with the, with the, the rally or, or the message. Um, and there's another interesting book called Stop Saving the Planet, which points out that, you know, <laughs> buying those things are, isn't really the greenest thing to do as much as you're being a walking billboard for being environmental. So, um, you know, and, and replacing all our gasoline cars with electric cars, if you can do a conversion, that's one thing. But otherwise, you're throwing out a useful machine into a wherever, especially those programs that, you know, cash for clunkers, where they actually destroyed a, a functional vehicle so you could buy a new one with more money and more energy and all that. So uh, I'll just stop there because <laughs> I could just ramble on. <laughs> So it, you, you, it still is true that it, it is closed on Sundays. Absolutely. And the last time it was on the ballot, it won by a bigger margin, keeping it closed on Sunday. In fact, I've had people come into the county and experience it and say, gee, I wish we had tried this. You know, wish we hadn't given up ours. It's, it just, I mean, I, even when I travel, I just don't think about going to a store on Sunday. It's just not in my life. Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I shared with Sally earlier in the week that because I was interested, I knew she was in Bergen County and and chatted about about they're not shopping. And I said, well, my reference to it was uh, my cousin lives in a town called Pella, Iowa. And if she mows her yard on a Sunday, people will go by, slow down and scream at her sinner, sinner, because on <laughs> Sunday is supposed to be your day off. And so I thought, you know, those prescriptions really, um, it, it was tied with religion that I found really offensive. 
But then in my work life, I was in the restaurant business. I had employees who said, oh, I want to work seven days a week every day. Just put me down. And about the 10th day, they would just dump on you. It was just more than most people can handle. They need a day off every week. And then I kind of changed my mind about the idea that we just have one day set aside. And it's nice because that can be a family day. You know, we have we have to worry about the quality of life. You can't just tell people to stop shopping. What what is your life going to be about? And I guess I'm going to back up to another book I read, which was called The Moral Animal. And in it, uh, the author said that every society has uh, elite things. And so apparently we we do need to do that. But the elite doesn't have to be things. The elite could be who who is helping people more, uh, whose who's, um, garden looks the best. It could be something completely different than who's got the prettiest car. <laughs> Good. Let's... Yeah, our state Supreme Court has said that this is not a religious problem. It is a societal benefit to, you know, avoid the congestion and all that. And I have often told it. I admit that people who uh, have a Sabbath on Saturday have a bigger problem. But I have told them often that if we could get all the businesses to close on Tuesday or Wednesday or any hell day you want, that would be fine. Unfortunately, it ain't going to happen. We're stuck with Sunday because of history. But yeah. Vicki, would you like to share? Sure, thanks. Um, so I'm going to make a confession right up front. I, I have been a sustainable consumption researcher for over 20 years. Wow. So uh, I, I guess it's sort of in the gist of the, the impacts he was talking about, I, I'm quite familiar with those. Um, there were two that kind of jumped out to me. I, I continue to... Um, learn more about the impact of plastics and the he talked about the growth rate of plastics the doubling of consumption and plastics that kind of was a wow number for me um and then there was the one that he talked about and he's kind of loose in his language i mean for a researcher i'm a little bit more uh wanting to be precise <laughs> And so, you know, he said, oh, well, there was a fifth to a quarter drop in CO2 emissions during the first month of the pandemic. And hey, we were all waiting around to look at that. And boy, that, that is not what happened according to all of the, the material researchers I know. So, um, so that's not to say it wasn't a really interesting experiment. I mean, there was a lot of discussion about whether we were all going to bounce back. And it did seem like there, there was just a resumption of business as usual in terms of consumption. Um, so I guess, you know, I really came to hear um, other people's perceptions on the problem, because I, I think that the change is going to happen when we start having different relationships to each other and different relationships to the planet. And uh, that's different than just like thinking about reducing material consumption. So I only made it through chapter three. I'm not sure quite what the gist of his argument is yet. Um, it's, it's kind of, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, but I'm also a little bit reserved on it. Um, <laughs> maybe because I don't think it goes too far. So I will just say that I think we have a cultural problem and we are all as individuals conditioned by our culture and I think it's so deep and so embedded that we have a really hard time talking about it. So I thank you, UJC, for opening this conversation. Um, and though it may not be threatening to us, 
it may be threatening to a lot of people out there, the idea of reducing consumption. Well, so. I, I hope you, I hope we all can find the way to change our hearts in that way, you know, yeah. in order to make change. Because I agree with you, it, it's a deep, it's a deep change that needs to happen from a money culture, <laughs> a consumer's culture to caring more about the earth than we do about acquisition. Jane, would you like to speak? Um, I, I guess what I was gonna, I was gonna kind of echo what, um, what Sally said. I, I remember very well the, um, I grew up in Evanston, Illinois where they had pretty strong uh, blue, what we call blue laws, and no shopping in on Sundays, and it now now that's changed, um, but it did make a difference, and it was it was kind of a nice difference. Um, so that was one comment. Um, the other one was that I liked the the whole concept of you know, what does it mean to live at a sustainable level. I thought he did a good job, a really good job. Um, making that clear and, and interviewing and talking to people who um, were living in cultures that um, were sustainable um, at levels that um, would allow us to survive. So I, I like the way he, he um, categorized, I hadn't really thought about that before, categorized uh, different sorts of, uh, different levels of existence, I guess you'd say. Good. Well, and I hope we'll maybe in your small groups you'll come back to whether you've ever visited one of those countries that is on the level of making it and what that might teach us. Peggy, would you like to share? No. <laughs> no. It, um, I I don't want to say anything because I've been a scrounge forever. <laughs> and, and I don't want to buy more than I need. And I used the PTA thrift shop that was in my town. So I, I, I don't want to go there because I'm living in a retirement community and I'm the only one who moved in three years ago with an electric car. They installed a charging station for me. And <laughs> it's just crazy. I mean, I just, I just, I think we've spoiled the environment. I'm, I'm concerned about what people do. I mean, look how they kill people in wars but they do other things it's selfish and so i i don't want to talk to anymore i just, just <laughs> i want to hear what other people are saying well I, I think what you raise is that we do need to find a way to to have this conversation and i know for myself i can be so angry sometimes that i think how can I even listen? But um, it, it does seem like we need to be able to find the way to talk about it. <laughs> uh, who have I missed? Kenny, did, have you spoken? I can't see your picture, Kenny, but if you want to say something, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> uh, Angela? No, I'm not tonight. Thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can see who else is here. Roz? Hi. Hi. Um, the one thing that got me from the start of the book, you know, where they have all the quotes in big, bold type, was yeah. in a consumer society, there are inevitably two kinds of slaves, the prisoners of addiction and the prisoners of envy. And uh, that one kind of spoke to me as being someone who's envious of people who have nice things. And um, I grew up, uh, as my mom was a widow uh, with seven kids and she grew up through the depression. So, you know, we were, I was denied those purple bell bottoms and it really bummed me out back in, you know, fifth grade. But um, yeah, we made it through and, and that's not all that life is about. But when you 
look around at the um, our kids, that generation and our grandkids, um, they're, I don't know what we did, how we raised them so wrong. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> of course I'm generalizing, but you know, uh, birthday parties and all the stuff that goes along with that and all the toys and everything, um, just way overdone the holidays are way overdone um yeah so i did not finish reading the book so i look forward to uh reading some more and doing some more discussions with you <laughs> good well I, I what that raises for me is all the advertising that goes to children um it's just uh i mean even in our schools that advertisers pay to let the school they have to put up their ads in order to get some special program from the advertisers and it, it's like you can't get away from it and even the little kids can't get away from it anyway that's what occurs to be as you're speaking <laughs> it's tough it's tough i mean we're so used to be able if we can afford it to buy whatever it is um and it it, it takes some heart juggling i guess Sharon, would you like to share? Can't see you. <laughs> Who am I missing here? Oh, here's some hands. Okay. Cindy? Well, I just want to go back to a comment Jane said, because I know in my area especially a lot of restaurants are closing earlier they are actually have one downtown in the heart of the city here now that closes on the weekends a lot of like the even like we have these convenience stores that were open 24 hours they are now closing like for 12 hours at night because they can't find help so actually some of that is being forced upon us it's just simply because of shortages of help and People have decided over COVID that, you know, I kind of like having my weekends off, so I'm going to keep them. So I, I think kind of by default, some of that is happening where people aren't able to shop and spend as much just because there's not those options anymore. And I guess really in a way, that's a good thing. So. Well, consumption is also about the way we consume our time or don't. <laughs> so it's a um, good point. Sally, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, the the advertising is definitely a driver of all the stuff. I think back to the old Yankee maxim, you know, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. That's such a depression era thing that's so alien from most of us, and yet it's so important. Um, I even think of of my dad in college, and and he wasn't he was a designer, and um, in an economics class saying. But how can you just keep on growing? Doesn't you know, isn't there a problem somewhere? And of course, nobody wanted to hear that back in right after World War II. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Well, and right after World War II was when a lot of this started. I think a lot of the, the upturn, people getting houses, and and the fashion industry took off, and so forth. I think one of the really uh, as interesting. As long as they were the right color in the right neighborhood. Yeah, yeah that's true. Absolutely. Go ahead, Terry. Oh, oh, I just thought the the story about the um, man who lived in the African bush, I guess, working thirty hours a week to cover everything, and really that covered cooking and cleaning the house or whatever, uh, cleaning the hut or whatever. Uh, we're working way more we keep we get more convenience but we work harder and harder and harder it, it it isn't conducive to the quality of life that we should be getting we have all these conveniences why are we working so darn hard <laughs> <laughs> i heard on the news lately that someone is trying to put out that we should only work four days a week instead of five i hope that goes somewhere <laughs> Well, and that will help the environment too, because there's less traveling and everything. So, oh. so time, the way we consume our time. Um, 
I'll, I'll raise something that I'm trying to do. Um, I, I live in a sustainable community. I retired and have a house that is very climate protective. I mean, the, my, my bills for heat, for example, average $50 a month, but I don't have solar yet. And I, I'm low income as a retired person, so I can get a lot of um, write-offs from, uh, from the state and so forth. And my challenge to myself is to raise the money to put up solar panels which means cutting back on expenses. I can't, I can almost buy nothing if I'm going to save for that. <laughs> um, and I figured out that I can probably within eight months save enough to put up solar panels. And that's the incentive to cut back on anything else. Uh, there's some things, I mean, I'm, over 50% of my money goes for housing and I can't get out of that. Um, but, I think it's helpful, for me, it's helpful to have a, a goal like that, some way that um, I feel like I can accomplish something if I do this cutting back. So I'll just raise that. And, and if any of you wanna share on things that you are doing yourselves to help the climate, I'd love to hear those. Well one one of the things, um, and I posted in the chat that really I was quite young. I was a teenager when somebody shared that I I would be if everybody was like me, I'd crash. We'd crash the economy because I spent so little money. Um, but saying that, one of the things that I think has helped me is basically to look at the useful life of of something. And not get rid of stuff. I, I was kind of amazed in the book when he talked about two thirds. I think it's two thirds of the clothes that are bought. It's two out of five. I don't. I can't remember exactly the numbers. Wind up getting thrown away within a year, and I'm like, wow. Why would somebody buy something and have it, you know, go in the trash within a year? So it's it's that. It's like really thinking about what. What I'm, what I'm buying, um, um, you know, and and how, you know, and, and that I'm not just going to use it for one time, but I'm going to keep using it. Um, but there was something else that you had talked about that I, anyway, I, I forget what it. Oh, sustainability, um, scarcity versus um, scarcity versus knowing you have enough. And part of one of my practices that I started a number of years ago is, is trying to say appreciations when I wake up. It's like, what do I appreciate about today? Um, because I think a lot of times consumerism is trying to fill a need that you don't even know you have rather than being in appreciation. And when you're in appreciation, you get out of scarcity. And I think scarcity is what drives consumerism that that brain set that says there's not enough. Good. That's part of the motivation piece that I think is so important now. Others. To, to add to that, one of the, the codependency books that I read said that people who live in scarcity are miserable. You You have to live in a place where whatever you have is is enough or there's going to be enough and of course if you don't have food that that would be kind of miserable but we're not in that position you know and we find people that have lots that are miserable because they don't have more and that's that's really tragic absolutely well i i think we are oh there goes a hand sally go ahead i just want to respond to the, to the comment about the clothing and, and also not even a year, the number of things that are worn once or not at all. Princeton Environmental Film Festival, which I highly recommend, the Princeton Library, it's been doing a bunch of virtual stuff. Uh, last fall, one of their films was Fast Fashion, the high, the real price of low cost fashion. It's excellent and it's really eye-opening. So 
I put That's the a video, later video chapter the in the chat. book too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we're small enough that we could go to these questions um, without going into small groups if you're up for that. Um, for example, I, I wonder if others of you have had experiences in um, countries that have a much lower standard of living. Whoops, Cindy, I know I see your hand. I'm sorry, go ahead, Cindy. <laughs> That wasn't my hand. I was just doing a thumbs up to staying in the. In a, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I don't know all the signal. <laughs> um, I, I spent time in Africa and and also in Central America and places in my life, um, and so struck by how it is possible to be happy and live a very different lifestyle. <laughs> um, in Africa, it, Africa is a, a Senegal is a, a Muslim country, and um, you have dinner. You sit down for dinner, and you sit around a platter and eat with your hands and so forth. And towards the end of the meal, particularly at dinner time, um, there will be a, some children come to the house, and they're called Talibé. They're um, from an orphanage. And they're coming to get some food. Um, and the family will fill their container with the rice and fish and vegetables from the platter for them to take back to the orphanage. And part of Islam is interesting to me because one of the pillars is giving. It's um, almsgiving. And instead of the outreached hand or cup or bowl being something uh, that you would like to avoid as we might someone asking us on the street for money, um, it's a gift to the person they're reaching towards to give alms because that's one of the uh, pillars of Islam is giving alms to the poor. So you're actually being given a gift when someone asks you for pennies or food or whatever it is that you see in that culture. And I, to me, that was just kind of mind blowing to make that connection with religion and uh, the culture in Senegal. So that's an example from me of being in a, uh, one of those countries that is way down in terms of how much consumption they do. And I'd be interested in your other visits to countries where you might have had an aha experience. Well, I actually think the indigenous people way back in the early days, that was basically how they operated as well. In this country and yes. anywhere, yeah. Absolutely. Others? Yeah, okay. Um, it's not, so I, I've traveled all over the world, but mostly um, I spent most of the time in Europe and um, Australia, been to Mexico, um, been to Turkey. So I kind of across the spectrum. Um, but uh, two interesting things that I've read. One was um, the amount of money spent on food and how much food you get. And basically the poorer the country, the more food you got for your money. So American, $100, basically you got nothing compared to what you would get in Morocco for $100 for food. Um, so we have to think about that. It's, it's like we, we, we get cheap food, but it's not necessarily high quality food. Because um, what they did was they put out what a day, you know, what people ate in a day. And then the other thing was um, not, not just how much we spend on food and the quality of food. Because um, in Morocco, it was all fresh food. Um, but the other was, again, yeah, what was it I was going to say? Um, um, oh, I read a book and a rich man um, went up to this wise man and said, I know. I need to give way more, but I, I, I'm having a hard time doing that. How do I, 
how do I become more generous? And the wise man said, well, take some coins in one hand and give them to your other hand and get used to giving and receiving <laughs> because that's one of the things with people that have enough. And this is what I, I'm guilty of. I have a hard time receiving. I, I, I give, but it's like, I think I should give more, but it's like I have to also receive. So it's a, it's a two-way street. You have to be comfortable with both. And, and then once this you know, rich man got used to you know, going back and forth between his hands, then he could start giving gifts to other people. Um, because really, literally, when you give gifts, as you talked about, it's like you get a gift. So. Great. And take time to appreciate that when you've done it. <laughs> yeah. Others. Experiences abroad. Or in other parts of our I have own. not lived anywhere else. I've visited a couple of European countries in my life, but nothing uh, you know that, that lives anything near sustainably. I do live way more sustainably than, than my peers around me, but that's not really enough. <laughs> well, it's also Sorry. looking at our country, living have have you lived in parts of our country where not everyone was affluent? <laughs> Uh, well, I did live, I spent a couple of years out in um, Illinois, but that was, it was an agricultural community. It was to, I was working in a stock theater, but it wasn't that different, really. Uh, we did go, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the first day I was there, an actress and I went into a diner for breakfast and somebody said to us, oh, it looks like the theater's open. <laughs> so we obviously <laughs> weren't recognizable. <laughs> as, as non-locals um, and we went to the local Mexican restaurant where the farm workers ate and it took them a couple of times for us for them to really what what are these Anglos doing here <laughs> but, uh, huh. yeah. then when when my parents came out and I sent dad in, into Los Tres Amigos to pick up some nachos for us they were quite friendly with them so yeah. Good. Well, when you think of your own life, um, <clears throat> have you considered what is a need and what is um, just a want? I mean, I wonder if you have some examples of um, what you really need to hold on to. I mean, I think I, I want to be able to see my kids, for example. They live in, I'm in Salem, Oregon, and they're in Portland and Seattle and how I, I wouldn't and my grandkids too. I, I don't want to give that up. But I've been driving my car. <laughs> uh, and I could take the train. I had a dog and it was hard for me to take the train. My dog has died. I don't have an excuse anymore. I could take the train to Seattle instead of driving. So it's an example of I really am not going to give that up. But what can I do to make it uh, better for the environment, I guess. So do you have some ideas in that in your life too? I wanna um, just offer actually on the last question. What I think about is um, I've lived in many countries um, and I grew up partly overseas and we used to have jokes about how America was toilet paper land, you know, because you know, how much toilet paper we got through. Anyway, but um, at the start of the pandemic, um, we had an asylum seeker come to live with our house. So we got 50% more use out of our house um, than, than we'd had before, <laughs> um, which was nice. Uh, and it worked out fine. I have a relatively small house, 915 square feet, um, but, you know, 325 square feet was enough. And I think, you know, that's one of the big consumption categories, house space. <laughs> uh, 
And a lot of people don't want to give that up and they don't want to give up their privacy and they don't want to, you know, there's a lot we could do around sharing resources. So, uh, but the, the big interesting thing was for me, it was I had done a lot of work around um, food waste. And one of the, you know, facts of food waste is that almost everything, uh, the average of what goes into the house, we bring into the house, 40% of that goes to waste in food waste. So we spend a lot of just throwing out food. And I thought I was pretty good at it. You know, there are lots of kinds of practices you can undertake and prompts and all of this stuff. But to watch uh, my friend from El Salvador make meals was astounding. I mean, we never had anything go to waste. Um, and, you know, just her skill at being able to bring things at it, and which I don't do. I go to the refrigerator and I kind of look and say, well, what would I like to eat? You know, which is one of my big <laughs> expense categories. So I eat really well. But just the fact that even, you know, doing that regular routine of oh, what is it that I have a preference for in terms of eating itself leads to a lot of food waste. And um, just the skill of, and the resourcefulness of watching Paris, you know, put together these amazing meals from what I would consider scraps, uh, little bits of leftovers, it was totally um, mind opening to me. Wow. So. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> and it isn't even just food waste in the home. The food waste at the restaurants is just astronomical. Yeah. And like convenience stores that make up food that after so many hours they have to throw it away because it can't sit out that long. It isn't just what's at home, it's just what in general we throw away, which is just absolutely sickening if you think about it. And I mean, how many people we could feed if we didn't throw that food away? And I think there are children in this country that go to bed hungry. It's true. I think we can grow more too. I, I learned last summer that. Um, <laughs> I didn't have to buy salad anymore if I just took my nasturtium leaves and my sorrel leaves and made that salad. And when that, that didn't, when the nasturtiums went away, I started eating uh, dandelion greens. <laughs> so I think we can be creative um, in our eating. <laughs> Others in terms of your needs versus wants? Sally's got her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm wasting. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, you mentioned the train. My immediate thought for you was, can you visit your? Is there a train that runs by? You like the train, actually. I I went to GA uh, in New Orleans by train, and it was really a nice way to travel. You got to have extra time for a long trip like that. But um, one of my biggest wants that, that gets in the way of my non-consumerism is books. However, I have found uh, various used book sites online so that I'm not getting new books. I don't have a library in my town, which makes me beyond cranky. So I'm wind up buying, but I'm buying the you know Better World Books $3.98 versions. And, uh, you know. and I lived 10 years without a car in Bergen County, New Jersey, which is not an easy thing to do. But it started out, it was just like, after I had totaled the car, I wasn't ready to drive again. And then it became an environmental challenge. And living right across the street from a New Jersey transit train station and a couple of blocks from a bus, I, I managed. I rented a car for a few times. And when that got to be too much and my parents were getting older and I needed to be able to get there without relying on mom to pick me up from a train station, I broke down and bought a, a used hybrid Prius. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. 
Well, it is it is a transition <clears throat> to go from driving to taking the bus. I'm working on that one too. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's a, it's also working with your city to make sure that they have public transit that goes where you are. We're working yes, on we, that in Salem because it's not a good transportation system. We call ours New York Transit in New Jersey because if you want to go into New York or in the southern part of the state, if you want to go to Philadelphia, there are options. <laughs> not yeah. so much other places. Yeah. Yeah. Back to food waste. You know, when the restaurant business, we had our dishwashers scrape the plates into a bucket and then we had some pigs at the farm and we fed them that. But when we did the math on everything, we we were it, it wasn't a good financial thing, but we didn't waste the food. I mean, it, it got used. And when I think of food waste in restaurants, um, we went to I think it's called Excalibur in Las Vegas. And they had a, you know, Knights in Armor show and everything, but they gave everybody, I think it was a whole chicken and the more than half was left over in every occasion. And what they would do, they would scrape that in and they would feed it to animals. They would have to cook it to make sure there were no bacteria, but it was a, a horrendous amount of waste. Imagine having a whole chicken for everybody in your family. But the, the um, pandemic has kind of changed my relationship with, with using food up because we were, we were home all the time. So, you know, we knew if we had something left over, this is what we had to do to use it up. My mom was fantastic about never throwing anything away. We, and of course, it probably helps not to have too deep of a refrigerator so things don't get shoved to the back and turn green before you realize that you should have used this up. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, let me ask one last question, and that is, when was the last time that you saw the Milky Way? <laughs> <laughs> I just whole... saw it. <laughs> Say that again? Awesome. I just saw it camping. Oh. <laughs> nice. I was thinking my cross-country trip in the 80s, then go move managed to somehow wind up crossing through Death Valley at night instead of in the afternoon as we had planned. It was awesome. Yeah. I'll bet. It would be really clear. And my urban friend kept saying, oh, then, you know, let, let's leave. This is like, you know, there's nobody out here. And I'm like, this is wonderful. Let's just enjoy this. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that was interesting was uh, the author mentioned traveling and and coming home and uh, when we traveled we had raincoats and everything else so that if the weather turned bad we were still out doing things and i've come to realize that sometimes we just pass up going outside i'm, I'm in central iowa we pass up going outside because oh the weather's not too nice actually it hasn't been nice the last couple of days it's been windier in the dickens but um and that's not fun to walk in but if I were traveling, I would go out in it anyway. I wouldn't sit in a hotel room because it's too windy. And I guess the things that I really appreciated when I was traveling that are right here at home. I mean, flowers and trees and bushes and birds and everything. You, it's amazing the things that we have right under our noses and just don't bother to appreciate. I'm in this sustainable community, and one of the requirements is that if you have lights outside, they have to face down and not up. Um, but I still cannot see the Milky Way because of the city being near and so forth. Hmm. I can see planets like I never have before. They're very bright, but I can't see the stars. Hmm. I think the last time I saw them really clearly was in Africa because there just were not street lights around. Um, and I saw the Southern Cross, which I'll never forget. Um, hmm. So, it, but that was different in childhood. I remember seeing them a lot when I was young. Others of you, have you seen the Milky Way? Hmm. Anyone? Sure, yeah, in California. I... Go ahead. I saw it while hiking on the Appalachian Trail in 2014. Ah, 
Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I, I lived in the country when I was a child. We didn't have a lot of lights back then. Of course, that area has changed greatly, but we saw that a lot. And actually, I was in, I'm in North, I went to Appleton, Wisconsin, but I was up in northern Wisconsin when I was a kid. And we would see the northern lights fairly regularly, especially in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. Angela? Yeah, as I was say, I, we, I can see them in California. I live out in the country. Oh, you can. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> you are fortunate. <laughs> Is it desert? No, no, I live uh, uh, north of Chico. I mean, north of, I live in Chico, north of uh, Sacramento in oh, Ag, okay. Ag World. <laughs> Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing to see them. <laughs> the, the new zoning uh, for the immediate area south of my house, and I live in a boarding house, so my footprint is, my housing footprint is small. I, I share a house with 20 people, um, a three story old you know, 19th century, uh, but 20th century, early 20th. Um, Anyway, they included uh, dark sky compatible lighting in the in the plan, and I was like, "Go with the flake." <laughs> Great. <laughs> Anyone else, <laughs> or uh, on any other subject? Because I I will say a few things before we close. But if if you have things to bring up, this is a good time. <laughs> well, I would just like to say too that when you travel. I think you need to be very careful who you support because I am so upset with Disney. I had a friend who's supposedly a, she's a climate person. She's concerned about the environment, but yet her and her husband went out to celebrate 50 years of Disney. And I said to her, why would you go celebrate 50 years of Disney creating ecocide? They continue to take swamp and wetlands and Everglades for what? For profit. So those are the kinds of things you need to think about. If someone builds a great big huge resort in some mountain somewhere, I don't support that because that is a footprint that is not necessary. I would rather go there and just be in the woods than go there and be in some huge building now that has taken up most of the woods. So that is also something you need to consider when you travel. Do not support people that continue to take our land and make these huge footprints and take swamp lands for the sake of making money. Yeah, that okay. occurred to me too when we were talking about toilet paper. I just heard that Procter and Gamble are use are cutting down the trees in in a virgin forest in Canada to make toilet paper. Yeah, and there's, there's been a campaign for a while to get Procter and Gamble to make Charmin sustainable. That's yeah. yeah. There's one other wonderful problem. books now on trees. Um, finding the mother tree and we need to protect them <laughs> there's one other problem with disney and that's that they got a 99 year tax abatement not to pay no taxes in central florida they're not citizens if you're not paying taxes and i don't know if you saw today the uh, top 20 uh, most wealthy people average 3.4 percent in their their taxes which i can tell you we just wrote the check we pay a lot more than that <laughs> uh, and i don't know if any of you have seen the movie avatar oh, i yeah. just watched the movie avatar and i'll tell you that is one powerful message it really is so if you've not seen it i would see suggest going to the library and seeing if you can find it is it an old movie? It's not a new movie? Yeah, it's probably about, no, I want to say at least 10 years old now, but it's very, yeah. per, very pertinent still. Uh, I could also recommend a movie. It's called The Economics of Happiness. And this is uh, about how uh, consumerism is not making us any happier. And it's also about the need to transition to local economies. It's uh, quite relevant to the subject of our book, and it's a documentary. So it can be gotten online somehow? Yes, I believe it's available for free online. Oh, that's great. We need a, we need a resource list. <laughs> yeah, Charlie, would you put the name of that in the chat, please? Yes, I'm going to see if I can get a link for it, too. Vicki? I've got one on Local Futures. 
Okay. Yeah, Vicki, you I have... just want to say that the big dilemma that I see is that people don't want to be shamed. And this comes up a lot in the discussion the, around meat consumption. And, you know, people's choices, their consumer choices, they don't want to be shamed in it. And so unless we learn how to have conversations with people who feel like that, I think we're dead in the water about trying to get things changed. Um, and I you know, given a lot of that because some of this is hardwired behavior. The consumption behavior is hardwired, right? And um, it's something that I, I hope we can think about a little bit here and say, how do we, how do we meet that challenge? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I find it astounding that, you know, half of Trump's rallies consist of shouting about my freedom to put in light bulbs or they're going to take my cows away, you know? And I mean, it's a real existential threat to a lot of people because they've based their whole word on a certain kind of uh, level of, I think, control and power over their lives. So I think it, it, it does relate to that as well. So um, just to throw it out there for thinking about as we go forward. I'd love to have that discussion. Well, I wonder if, well, we can find other ways for them to participate. If, you know, you can't give up the cows, maybe you can do something else that's socially beneficial. Well, when you mention light bulbs, I, I think of the movie Jeffrey as a play and um, there's a, a um, a dream sequence where the, they're having a, a, a contest and, and that they, uh, the question that they're asking the contestants is uh, what, let, let's see, what, what can be deadly for sex? And the, the answer to the question was fluorescent lights. And I think of, of Trump's makeup and everything, and it, did, it didn't look good under fluorescent lights. And that's why he was against um, changing from incandescent to, to anything energy saving. Although <laughs> if he had a brain, he would know that, that LEDs can come in a wide range of colors and you can, <laughs> you can get pretty close to incandescence with LEDs. With a blue tint or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, it said it made him look orange, and it's like, well, change your makeup. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, I will agree with you, Val, but I have no problem shaming someone who says they're an environmentalist about Disney. But I get your point about, you know, the other people. Yeah, well, let's have that conversation funny. next. Go ahead, Vicki. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it's difficult. And it's not really about politics completely. Um, I know many people who, you know, that I consider have my sympathies that don't. Um, and there are a lot of people who said, oh, I grew up in small towns, you know, and they come from a conservative background and it's about being resourceful and it's about being community. So, but there's a way that because we're uncultured, I think, to consume, overconsume, yeah, um, you know, that it's patriotic, it's about freedom, it's about all of these things. Um, and I, I think people feel a certain amount of shame around it. And, uh, you know, and then it makes it really hard to be able to have a conversation about how can we change things together. Mm -hmm. so. The one that's hard for me is I have environmentalist friends who do not even consider to give up their gas furnaces. <laughs> and um, we need to get rid of gas as well as oil. Um, 
So I, I, I think this would be a great conversation to have because I think it's huge. <laughs> um, we, we have different things that we're going to hold on to that do hurt the planet. But how do we have that conversation? I mean, can it just be done by modeling and keeping our mouths shut? Or um, is there a way to have the conversation? So let's put that on the agenda for next time. <laughs> um, well, I, I have heard, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I think COVID uh, kind of informed the part of what you're saying. And my daughter said it's been really difficult to socialize because some of their friends paid no attention to being careful all caution to the wind and then to other friends who were totally totally um well almost paranoid they weren't careful enough and it was difficult to to hit that sweet spot so and and with the environment i think we're we're going to have to love people into to giving up what we've been doing we aren't aren't going to shame them into it very easily Right, right. Well, I've heard enough interest, I think, in going on. So I, I just want to put out whether you all are available next. next it's, not, it's not next. It's the 20th. Next Thursday. Yeah, it is next Thursday, the 21st, mm -hmm. um, to have a second session. And then we can decide that time if we will do a third session. <laughs> it, to really uh, cover the book, I think it's about a... a chapter and a half or so and then um or a section and a half or so in each section has a bunch of chapters so i to have three all together seems to me to cover um would cover the book well if we are open for that and at the moment what i suggest is that we'll put it out and again uh it, it's the same address right to get on terry uh it can be or should we put out another? It, we can do it either way, Lucy. Well, you will get a mailing anyway um, about this with some more questions to think about. Um, and I think it goes through page 69, the next section, if I remember correctly. 169. Um, yeah. So <laughs> does that sound good to you guys to keep going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm I... very pleased with this conversation. I'm glad it worked. In some ways, I'm glad it was smaller than 24 people because it was much easier to have the conversation. <laughs> May I really briefly share my screen before we wrap yes. it up? Yes. Um, I followed the link to the um, Economics of Happiness site, and I remembered seeing this last year and not being able to do anything with it. World Localization Day. We're you know, really focusing on local economies and, and ecology and so forth. And I would like you, JEC, to do something with this, this sometime, although it's June, we've got GA, we'll never have a chance, but everybody look at it. And if you can do something, you're fine. Uh, interesting. Oh, yeah. I, it just went away. Oh, uh, did you, I'll, put it, a, I'll put it back. <laughs> yeah, there was a picture of a woman there. If you scroll down just a little bit, Yes, that woman right there, uh, Helena Norberg Hodge. She is uh, prominently featured in that film, The Economics of Happiness. Ah. Oh, okay. Yeah, this this is this is their site, uh, Local Futures. Yeah, uh, it, it sounds uh, a lot like them. <laughs> yeah, I I did. I when you mentioned the title, I kind of thought I recognized it, and then I went and I said, Oh yes. This is this is like something I want to get involved in when I have free time. <laughs> when I can well, afford, when I can time, find, we can, we can well, I can find some the, colleagues to make some free time with. <laughs> we can look at the movie before then too. <laughs> Talk about it. That would be great. Um, okay, so you'll get something in the mail. Um, and I, again, I appreciate you all coming. It's been very good. It's encouraging to me to think that we can have these conversations. And I, one thing I'd ask you in the future is what your connections are with congregations. And is there a way to bring material like this to your congregation? You know, what would that be like? Um, 
do you have suggestions that UUJEC can do to get word out about subjects like this and keep the dialogue going? And thank you, Lucy, for a masterful le leadership on this. Yes. <laughs> no, you did a great job. Yep, thanks, Lucy. And have a very happy consumer free Easter. <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Oh, aren't Enjoy, you nature. Get a Enjoy nature in spring. <laughs> you aren't going to have yeah, a chocolate all, bunny. All the all the, <laughs> all the buds are out. The, the blooms are, are coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's time. Okay. We're still snowing here. I'm sorry to say. I don't know yeah. why we're having the coldest oh. spring ever. Oh. We had snow yesterday, about... but not just a little bit. Not not enough to. I was accumulate. hearing about snow in the Dakotas on the INITC call today and, and the winds that were so strong, they were blowing over double wide trailers being moved. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there was a truck that wow. uh, yeah. was blown off the road and, yeah. uh, and onto its side, not just not off yeah. the road, but, you know, it was yeah. uh, lying on its side and the way to Des Moines. Yeah, Johnny was saying, you know, you guys, uh, when the weather says no, you just got to not do things. <laughs> and, uh... One of the scariest times in my life was I served two congregations in, in uh, North Dakota, one in Fargo and one in Bismarck, and I would drive between them. And there was a whiteout on that oh. road between the two, and I have never been as terrified as I was that day. Yeah, I, I stopped and stayed overnight in Jamestown because there's no way to drive. No. I experienced something like that in Utah. I was going from the ski areas down to visit a friend in, in Salt Lake, and and the snow was just coming at me. I couldn't see anything else. It was white knuckles until it cleared. Luckily, it's it did. blinding. <laughs> Okay, well, thank right. you all. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Good to see, see you. you next time. Good to meet you. Okay. And... Bye.